you are about to watch a video about solitude and aloneness as lifestyle choices that reflect the innate essence of the individual who is making this choice. Do not confuse this with mental health issues. I'll give you one example. Depression. People who are depressed tend to isolate themselves, withdraw from the world, avoid others. This, is also, this applies equally to narcissists. When narcissists lack narcissistic supply, are unable to regulate their internal environment with feedback from the outside, they become depressed and they tend to withdraw to the schizoid phase in narcissism. But the following video doesn't discuss any of this because these are all manifestations of mental illness and underlying mental perturbance or disorder or disturbance or problem or dynamic. Some people just love to be alone. They adore solitude. They find contentment and happiness in their own company. They stimulate themselves and they thrive in a private space devoid of any and all social interactions. Contrary to popular myths and to many schools in psychology, this is not a mental illness. This is healthy. It's a choice. There's a new buzzword afoot, isolophilia. <laughs> As a collector of $10 words, I immediately lunged and pounced upon this new word in order to explicate it to you, enlighten you, elevate you, and bring you to a state of solitary nirvana. Why solitary? Because isolophilia is a love of solitude. And apropos solitude, my name is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, a former visiting professor of psychology and currently on the faculty of SIAPS as a professor of psychology and a professor of management studies. Okay, introduction over. Let's delve right in. First of all, I take issue with the, with the word isolophilia because it's comprised of two words, isolation and love, philia. So I take issue with that because isolation has negative connotations. You know, we isolate dangerous pr prisoners in uh, maximum security facilities. We isolate ourselves. We isolate other people as a form of punishment and so on and so forth. So isolation has, is a negative thing while Isolophilia is not a negative thing, it's a choice, and it brings a lot of happiness to the isolophil. I would, have I would rather use the word solophilia, the love of being alone, but <laughs> it's too late. Someone else coined the word, and I will not open a war, a war of words online. Okay. So, first of all, it's very important to understand there are multiple mental health conditions, multiple states of mind, multiple environments, many circumstances, diverse relationships in which isolation, solitude, being alone are an integral part and a determinant of the condition. There are differences, nuanced shades between isolophilia and these other situations. Take, for example, schizoid, schizoid personality disorder, schizoid uh, core, schizoid behaviors, and so on and so forth. On the surface, they look exactly like isolophilia. Schizoids isolate themselves. They avoid other people. They constrict their lives, usually, at least socially, but it's not the same. Implied in the word schizoid is the assumption that this constriction of life, this withdrawal, this turning in and cutting out the world 
are the outcomes of some mental health issues. Schizoid, in other words, is a form of mental disturbance, mental disorder, mental health uh, problem. That's why we have schizoid personality disorder. This does not apply to isolophilia. Isolophilia is utterly, unmitigatedly healthy. And as I said, involves a choice. It's not, it may, uh, isolophilia may be a predisposition or a predilection or a proclivity or a tendency. I'm running out of synonyms. It may come from the inside, but it is who you are. As an isolophil, you are happiest when you are in your own company. You're your best friend. You're your best company. You're your best companion. The schizoid does not experience happiness and elation and euphoria and contentment when he or she is alone with himself or herself. Schizoids don't derive pleasure from being alone. The schizoid condition is an attempt to avoid discomfort, displeasure. The company of others is a form of torture, so the schizoid avoids this pain and this um, discomfort by isolating himself or herself. It is, in other words, reactive. It's not a choice it's similar to recoil or startle reaction in PTSD. Introverted people. Introverted people also, on the surface, are identical to isolophils. Introverted people stay at home. They prefer solitary activities. They avoid company and socializing and, and so on and so forth. And introverts feel comfortable. Uh, with their lifestyle choices and with the environment that they had constructed for themselves. They feel comfortable with who they are. In this sense, introverted people are very close to isolophils. But isolophils are capable of exiting the isolophilic condition, socializing and so on and so forth. While in, with introverted people, this is more rare. It can and does happen. Introverted people, you know, end up once in every 10 years, they end up in a nightclub or something, but it's very forced, uh, full of anxiety, and usually not a pleasant experience, while the isolophil can transition between states uh, without any problem. An isolophil can become social for a while and enjoy it. That's the difference between the isolophil and the introverted. Similarly, the socially anxious person, social anxiety, the avoidant person, the, the shy person. These are people who are terrified of feedback, social feedback, social um, judgment, social opprobrium, um, criticism. They're terrified of this. They're terrified of failing. There's a performance anxiety involved. So socially anxious, avoidant and shy people are driven by what we call negative motivation. They, they, they avoid society, not because they want to. Many of them crave to have a friend, to socialize, to go out, to date, but they just can't. They can't because they catastrophize. They anticipate the untoward, the negative outcomes of attempting to interact with other people. They have such a bad object. They have such a coalition of voices inside them that informs them that they are unlovable, unworthy, um, inadequate, ugly, stupid, and so on. So this bad object informs the socially anxious person, the avoidant person, the shy person. Don't go out there because you are transparent. People are going to see right through you. And they're going to realize how defective and deformed and deficient you are. And you don't want this to happen because it's very painful. None of this applies to the isolophil. The isolophil has a healthy self-esteem. 
he, is, he or she is self-confident, sense of self-worth is highly regulated internally, so that's not a narcissist. It's just someone who prefers his or her own company, prefers to be alone. Why is that? Why would anyone prefer to be alone? Well, let's start with some objective facts. The overwhelming vast majority of humans, of people, are as dumb as nails in a buried coffin. I hope the metaphor is apt. I mean, they are dumb beyond imagination. And not only are they dumb, but owing to the Dunning-Kruger effect, they consider themselves geniuses, experts on everything, and so on. This is very irritating and annoying and aggravating. Next, most people are dishonest. Most people are dishonest. Studies have conclusively demonstrated this. Third, most people nowadays are narcissistic. They feel entitled. They are grandiose. They are divorced from reality. They are aggressive or passive aggressive. In short, most people nowadays are difficult and high maintenance. <laughs> I just gave you three excellent reasons to avoid all people without an exception. I gave you excellent reasons to become an isolophile, to choose the isolophilic lifestyle. I'm not talking about the unabomber option, a hermit-like monkish seclusion. That is constriction of life. That is schizoid. That is not healthy. That is not isolophilia. It's a, a giving up on the world, giving, rejecting life, and impairing reality testing. That's a choice that drives people into insanity, into mental illness, as has been the case with the Unabomber. In the best case, it's a respite. In the worst case, it's a recipe for mental illness. That's not what I'm talking about. Isolophils are schizoid to some extent, but they are schizoid only behaviorally, not psychodynamically. Some of them are also asexual, which is a legitimate sexual orientation, not being turned on by sex, not liking sex. They all, isolophils, all crave solitude. And they crave solitude because the alternatives to solitude are obnoxious, dumb, dishonest, difficult people. And that is the vast majority of humanity nowadays. Statistically, you are far more likely to come across such people than across nice, kind, interesting people, intelligent people. Far more likely. So why bother? There's a feeling of why bother? So they crave solitude and they must enjoy their own company. They find their own minds and their own company stimulating, thought-provoking, transformative. They're able to conduct a dialogue with themselves which yields results outcomes in terms of personal growth and development, acquisition of knowledge, insight, and excitement and thrill. These people, isolophils, are happiest when they're engaged in solitary activities. The problem is society. Isolophilia, I repeat, is an utterly healthy choice. It's a choice and it's utterly healthy. It is founded, of course, on the ability to enjoy one's company, on the capacity to function perfectly and healthily even without other people. You need these prerequisites to become a healthy isolophile. But society regards such people as weirdos. Society says something's wrong with you. You're mentally ill. You need treatment. You need medication. And well-meaning people attempt to impose on isolophiles companionship, group activities, dating, matchmaking, I mean, you name it. Society, which is comprised, as you recall, of in, inordinately stupid people. Society is unable to comprehend difference, the other. And so it tries to homogenize 
society tries to homogenize and to level the playing field so that everyone is the same everyone is equal everyone there's they are not superior people in inferior people as is the reality of course some people are vastly superior to others but there's no such thing we are all equal we are all equally endowed equally educated equally expert equally knowledgeable equally everything and this more these mores of equality and equity and and false modesty and they are an imposition on the isolophile whatever else the isolophile is usually highly intelligent otherwise he would not have been able to stimulate himself or herself the isolophile is honest sometimes abrasively and brutally honest and society demands that the isolophile gives up these things society says it's very bad to be alone it's a bad choice and it's an indication that something's wrong with you and you must compromise you must compromise you must pretend that you are modest and humble it's known as pseudo humility you must uh, not display your intelligence you must suppress it or repress it somehow you must pretend that everyone is equal and you are equal to everyone else in other words you must be dishonest and these demands are not acceptable to the isolophiles people are well-meaning but they're also idiots and morons and that's not acceptable acceptable to the isolophiles so some isolophiles react aggressively to such incursions and invasions of their private space they hate it they resent the implication that something is wrong with them and they doubly resent the imposition and the um, brutal uh, attempt to somehow take over their lives and mold and shape their lives for them so many isolophiles having been exposed repeatedly to society's um, inexorable um, attempt to change them many isolophiles become misanthropic men haters or women haters people haters they become cantankerous grouchy grumpy they become ornery difficult to deal with offensive haughty which resembles narcissism very much but is not the haughtiness of the isolophile is not based on grandiosity it's based on the recognition that the isolophile is different to other people and so that the isolophile has uh, a right to choose the lifestyle that best fits the isolophile that is a bit of an arrogant grandiose in your face defiant statement and it is misperceived as narcissism or even psychopathy when it's not so most isolophiles become defensive and the more defensive they become the more they withdraw the more they avoid society the well the actions of well-meaning people who are trying to match the isolophile with someone or to invite the isolophile to parties or to go out with the isolophile to to a nightclub or to cinema or whatever all these activities of well-meaning people drive the isolophile away they have a, a counterproductive impact they just demonstrate to the isolophile why isolophilia is actually a great idea <laughs> so isolophilia is misperceived as dysfunctional behavioral strategy but it's not what is dysfunctional behavioral strategy is when the isolophile begins to drive or attempt try to drive everyone away when the isolophile tries to secure the al aloneness and private space uh, by behaving aggressively arrogantly so isolophilia in itself is actually an adaptive behavioral strategy because it caters to the internal constitution composition and psychodynamics of the individual of the isolophile but 
when society pushes the isolophil to the corner, besieges the isolophil, attacks the isolophil all the time, some isolophils develop dysfunctional behaviors, which include aggression, as I mentioned. And the, it's a desperate attempt to drive away the nuisances that people make of themselves to some some uh, boundary to set some boundaries to to somehow uh, render the firewall that isolates the isolophil impermeable and efficacious and society is so insistent and so judgmental that many isolophils end up becoming highly dysregulated and dysfunctional, aggressive, unpleasant, unkind, haughty, grandiose, offensive, cantankerous, uh, misanthropic, uh, reticent people. It is society that drives isolophils to become actually schizoids or worse. Isolophil needs space, private space, in order to thrive. That is a requirement of the isolophil. As a minimum, society can respect this preference and let the isolophil be. Live and let live. But we're in an age of we are in an age of intrusion via social media and in other ways into people's private lives. There's no privacy anymore. And there's no real ability, despite atomization, despite technological self-sufficiency, there's no real ability to isolate yourself truly as in the older old days. Today you can't go to a mountain top, a mountain top and then spend 40 days wandering about the universe and the riddles of divinity or whatever it is that you wonder about because you will find yourself surrounded by 20,000 other people who have had exactly the same idea. There are too many of us, simply. This makes azolophilia an isolated phenomenon, very difficult to maintain. Bon chance.